Hello everybody, uh, my name is Mike Buckby and I do not have a CISSP certification, though I would like one. Um, I used to have it, I had passed the test and then because I didn't keep up on my continuing professional education credits, I let it lapse. So this is uh, getting back in shape to take the exam and um, I think something that's really important is to kind of have a study buddy. And this is my attempt at being your virtual study buddy for the CISSP. Um, the plan is to go through, uh, study open test questions, talk about concepts, and work our way through the body of knowledge. Um, really encourage people, throw things in chat, tell me I have the wrong idea, tell me whatever you think would help, and we'll just go back and forth and work on passing the CISSP. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, I'm going to be going through uh, Quizlet, quizlet.com. If you search for quizlet.com and CISSP, you will find uh, a bunch of test questions put up from ISC squared. Um, so these are totally free. There's no restrictions on them. And we're just going to work through them. I encourage you to go sign up and work through them as well. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with the next question here. Uh, an estimate of how often a threat will be successful in exploiting a vulnerability over the period of a year. Um, I'm thinking maybe exploitation rate. Is that the right answer? Or uh, annualized rate of occurrence. Um, so it's a good thing to remember. ARO. And let me just fix my screen here one second. All right. And... I did not know that, so already we're off to a really great start. <laughs> Learning already. Um, authorizes the president to designate those items that are considered as defense articles and defense services and control their import and export. Um, so this is one of the Arms Control Acts. Um, I don't know what year though, so let's see. Uh, Arms Export Control Act of 1976. And still, cryptography is a weapon. So, authorize the president to designate those items, defense articles and defense services, and control their import and export. All right, Arms Export Control Act. Um, principle that ensures that information is available and accessible to users when needed. Um, sounds like availability. Hey, only took me three tries to get one right, but we'll take it. Um, and I think this kind of shows an interesting thing, like something that comes up a lot in studying for the CISSP is having a manager's view of this, uh, and not like a technician's view. And that's something that's hard to separate, especially if like probably most of us, you're probably not working as an auditor. Um, you're working at like actually configuring this, actually securing system, ac actually setting these things up. And the term I would use if I wasn't studying for this is probably something more like uptime or you know uh service hours or something else um and maybe not the step back conceptual availability and part of passing the exam is learning to kind of like think like a manager and to think in this very broad conceptual way um, all right an incident that results in the disclosure or potential exposure of data um i think this is just a breach a data breach breach um, so it's in the disclosure or potential exposure of that. So this is interesting that it says potential. Like a lot of times, you know, I always think of things like ransomware. The ransomware, even if a bunch of files are encrypted and then taken out of the network, that's still an exposure of data. Even if the encryption maybe isn't broken. If an attacker gets into your network, goes through all the files on your system that's in a potential exposure even if it's not like yanked out and up on you know a BitTorrent site to download all of the files from your company still a, an exposure of data and a breach controls that substitute for the loss of primary controls and mitigate risk down to an acceptable level um this is one of the <laughs> very manager conceptual ways of saying this um Auxiliary controls, maybe? Compensating controls. Compensating for something there. You're compensating for the lack of primary controls. Okay. 
And good morning, Steph. So, all right. Controls, let's see for the last, and I forgot how to click this button. All right. Actions that ensure behavior that complies with established rules. Um, sounds like controls to me. Compliance. Hmm. Actions. What threw me off is the actions. I feel like compliance, I always think of like regulations, but hmm. What's that? Compliance versus controls. All right, we're already on LinkedIn, so I don't know if this is going good or bad. On the other hand, the internal audit mandate, three lines of defense, senior management. Internal control designs, controls the process, risk management, compliance function is responsible to monitor specific risks. Hmm. Okay. Design the controls or process. But ensure behavior. I, I think it's, I'm taking this to mean like the study of this, the study of actions that ensure behavior or the category of actions that ensure behavior that complies with established rules is compliance. Okay. okay, supports the principle of least privilege by providing that only authorized individual processes or systems should have access to information on a need to know basis. Um, supports the principle of least privilege. Um, privacy by design, security by design. Oh, confidentiality. I'm just messing these up. Supports the principle of least privilege. Confidentiality. Hmm. That's not right CISSP. Oh. Triad. All right. Confidentiality, integrity, availability. Protected from unauthorized viewing. Okay. So anything that's unauthorized viewing. The principle of least privilege. Hmm. That doesn't entirely make sense to me, honestly. Like, certainly, I believe that's the definition for compliance from the other side. It's more this supports the principle of least privilege. Well, it's a tricky test. That's why we're studying for it. All right. Here's the expression of ideas rather than the ideas themselves. Usually protects artistic property such as writings, recordings, databases, and computer programs. Um... This is a legal thing, um, so I'm thinking it's either copyright or trademark, and I believe it's the expression of ideas. Hmm. I'm gonna go with copyright. No, got it. All right, so let's see. Copyright versus trademark. Copyrights protect creative or intellectual works and trademarks apply to commercial names, phrases, and logos. Okay. So my little mental mnemonic for this is trade. <laughs> that the trademark is for things that are in trade, such as commercial names, phrases, and logos. And anything else uh, would be copyright. So let's see if that would work for this. Expression of ideas rather than... All right, so it says artistic, so we know it's copyright because it's not trade. Which isn't a perfect analogy, but... We're, we need something to keep these in our heads. Hey, Ahmed. Thanks for joining us. I'm curious, is everyone in the chat, um, are you working on your CS, CISSP right now? Just be interested to know. Or if you have other certifications. Okay. Controls implemented to remedy circumstance, mitigate damage, or restore controls. Um, remedy circumstance. So we had compensating controls before... Um, ameliorating controls? Oh, corrective controls. Hmm. Controls element to remedy circumstance, mitigate damage, or restore. It's weird that controls are restoring controls, but I guess that makes sense. Corrective controls. I'm trying to think what a good example of that would be. That if there was a data breach and you came in and then you set permissions, I guess that would be a corrective controls. If you had a supply chain attack and, you know, there was a DLL that was put into your application that was, you know, messing with people and you took it out, that would be a restorative control. Corrective control. Oh, these names. 
Um, all right. 8-Bit Oni is going for Security Plus, but still interested. A lot of the concepts go back and forth. Um, though I think the Security Plus is maybe slightly more practical and technical. Um, never had a Security Plus, only the CISSP. Um, a breach for which it was confirmed the data was actually disclosed, not just exposed to an unauthorized party. Um, a confirmed breach? Oh, data disclosure. Okay, we had the other one that was trolls. An incident that results in the disclosure or potential exposure. So they're saying a disclosure is the people actually uh, got hold of the external data um, and not just that it was potential. So the breach is the larger category and then the disclosure, the data disclosure is the more precise one. And the reason I bring that up is that a lot of the questions are phrased oddly in the CISSP exam, where uh, it's both from a marketing perspective, but also it's a lot of like, what is the best thing? What is the most precise thing? What is the, the difference between these two very similar concepts? So just for myself, I'm trying to split those out and keep them as crisp in my mind as possible. Um, so, okay. Controls designed to discourage people from violating security directives. Um, scary controls. Um, designed to discourage people. I'm not sure. Deterrent. Well, certainly that is what a deterrent is. Um, hmm. Discourage to deter people. I just don't use the word deterrent a lot in everyday talk. Only like nuclear arms talks or something. Discourage people from violating security directives. Though I guess, you know, if I was working at the UN and wanted to discourage people from violating security directives, I would call it a deterrent. So, okay. Next. Controls designed to specify acceptable rules of behavior within an organization. Um, acceptable controls? Standard controls? Directive controls? Hmm. Specify. I guess that makes sense. All right, next. The care a reasonable person would exercise under given circumstances. Um, hmm. This is one of those legal terms. I'm trying to remember. Uh, uh, I don't know. Do care. Reasonable person would exercise under given circumstances. Hmm. Let me get a definition of that. Do care. Effort made. Prudent or reasonable party to avoid harm to another. Take the circumstances. The level of judgment that a person reasonably expected to do. Hmm. Guess you ask yourself, do you care? I like to think I'm a reasonable person. Okay, next. Similar to do care with the exception that a preemptive measure made to avoid harm to other persons or their property. Um, due diligence, I think. All right, 8-bit, yeah, I think this is it. I think this is the next one, which is due diligence. Similar to due care, with the exception there's a preemptive measure made to avoid harm. Let's look at due care, due diligence. All right, due diligence is making sure the right thing was done correctly, and due care is doing the right thing. All right, and so I saw one of the examples. Examples always help me. Also, this is going to the CISSP subreddit, which is fantastic. Um, there are so many good um, examples in there, resources people meet, sharing, people talking about how they pass the test and other things. Um, if you haven't checked it out, 
um, I'll go ahead and do that. So, um, all right, due care versus due diligence. Due care is doing what a reasonable person would do. Parents have a duty to care for their children, all right? Due diligence is the management of due care. I was talking about like which one is like the bigger concept. All right, so due care is kind of an aspect of due diligence, which makes sense. Due care and due diligence are often confused, they're related. Due care is informal while due diligence follows the process. I think a lot of, the term where I normally hear due diligence is like in mergers and acquisitions that the company that's acquiring the other company needs to come in and they're going to do their due diligence, which is they have this giant checklist of they're going to check everything. They're going to check like all the setups to make sure they're secure, that, you know, um, the process is in place, that um, people are, you know, hired and fired in the appropriate way and onboarded and exited in a structured way and that all of those things are happening. And that's really what I think of when it comes to due diligence and then due care. I think this is, this helps me that it's the more informal of that where it's not so much a checklist. Um, all right, cool. We're gonna clean this up. Okay. Due diligence. All right. I don't know why this is so small all of a sudden, but a process designed to identify potential events that may affect the entity, manage risk so it is within its risk appetite, and provide reasonable assurance regarding the achievement of entity objectives. Um, reads like something from the X-Files. Uh, <laughs> entity objectives. Maybe SCP. A process designed to identify a potential. So I think this is risk mitigation or risk tolerance. Risk, risk exploration, enterprise risk management. That enterprise, I think, is what got me. Um, okay. So risk management is the general thing versus enterprise risk management, which is the super formal entity objectives. I mean, that sounds like a band name, entity objectives. Authorize the president to regulate exports of civilian goods and technologies that have military applications. Uh, Arms Control Act of 1976. Oh, now it's my second favorite. Uh, <laughs> the Export Administration Act of 1979. Oh gosh, um, Export Administration Act. I guess the other one was the DOD. So if it says defense and military, it makes a lot more sense that it's an arms control act, that weapons, really the export of civilian goods. And this is the civilian, which is the Export Administration Act. Exports of civilian goods and toys that have military applications. But man, this military applications. Hmm. I guess if it starts, if it mentions civilian, then it's definitely the Export Act. But if not, it's the Arms Control Act. Hmm. Okay. Ensures the business focuses on core activities, clarifies who in the, in the organization has the authority to make decisions, determines accountability for actions and responsibility for outcomes, and addresses how expected performance will be evaluated. Um, these are organizational controls. Um, kind of like the one on compliance tricked me. Maybe this is something similar that it's just a large, broader concept. Sure as the business focuses on core activities. I don't know. Governance. Okay. Now I feel kind of silly because that's something Veronis. We talk a lot about data governance um, at Veronis, but ensures the business focuses on core activities, clarifies who in the organization has the authority to make decisions, determines accountability for actions and responsibility. I feel like this should be this always frustrates me. I feel like this should be at least clarified somewhat, like security governance or something else. So, Pixel, security forward, do you remember me? Um, I'll be honest, Pixel. We'll probably have to ask Cody or Mike or one of the other guys. <laughs> but uh, I don't remember you, but I'm very glad you're here. Um, okay. Security event that compromises the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of an information asset. All right, so I like that it has the CIA, the, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability 
uh, the CIA triad, security men. And security men, I would say disclosure? Incident. Hmm. I guess this could be anything. Integrity. All right, so I'm just gonna go through a quick like mental check of this. So confidentiality would be a data breach. Uh, so that would be a security incident, surely. Integrity, someone scrambles the database, puts all sorts of information in there, can't trust it, uh, can't trust that the, the information's clean anymore. So that would be a security incident. Or availability, like a, a DDoS attack. DDoS attack takes the website offline, no one can log in. Security incident. Um, all right, so that makes sense to me. All right, Mr. Minecrafter is back. Uh, there been any Minecraft related security incidents? I don't know. It feels like Microsoft accounts will get compromised or something. Um, okay. Comes in two forms. Making sure that information is processed correctly and not modified by unauthorized persons and protecting information as it transits a network. So we just talked about integrity. Is processed correctly and not modified. Like the technical, to me, I immediately think of, you know, encryption, um, like, you know, TLS, SSL encryption of like information over the wire. But so often that's not it, but making sure that everyone's being a control, like transit control. I don't know. Integrity. Hmm. Making sure the information is processed correctly and not modified by unauthorized persons protect the information as it transits an hour. I still feel like my example of the database from the other question was okay. I mean, that's certainly integrity. And I guess that's this. I guess that's processed correctly in the very abstract way that the CISSP, you know, views these things. But that would be a processing issue. But I didn't really think about the transit issue, but that makes sense as well. Hmm. Like if you could like slip um, an entry in the host file of a, of a computer that says like, oh, well actually Google's this other search engine that we set up that, you know, something else. And Mike and Cody, you've done, I think DNS cache poisoning as one of the other, um, one of the other videos on the channel. If people haven't checked that out, that's really cool. Um, all right, next accountable for ensuring the protection of all the business information assets from intentional and unintentional loss, disclosure, alteration, destruction, and something that's cut off, unavailability, accountable. So who's accountable for that? I feel like the security officer, yeah, information security officer. So the person or the, the role of that, Okay, Cody's saying better cap is the tool of choice for DNS cache poisoning, which we established was an integrity uh, security violation of the CIA triad, which also sounds like something from a movie. All right, granting users only the accesses, accesses that are required to perform their job functions. I would probably just written access, but hey, they're in charge. Granting users only the access that are required to perform their job functions. Least privilege? Um, least privilege, that was an easy one. Okay, electronic hardware and software solutions implemented to control access to information and information networks. Software solution to control access. Controls? <laughs> I don't know. This is where, like you can think about like, oh, there's all sorts of things, you know software and firewalls and hardware devices, but controls, logical, technical controls, hmm. electronic hardware and software solutions. It always frustrates me when they kind of use the, the name and the question and the answer. Like, okay. Logical, technical controls. Um, all right, next protects novel, useful, and non-obvious inventions. This is a patent. Patent. That was easy. All right. Oh, very cool. Mike shared the, the link to the DNS stream in the chat. Um, thank you for doing that, Mike. All right. Uh, next. Okay. 
Controls to protect the organization's people and physical environment, such as locks, fire management, gates and guards. Physical controls may be called operational controls in some contexts. This is one of those areas where I struggle, where all of my professional experience has really been in like, you know, software startups or, you know, big enterprises and things. But certainly, you know, if you have physical access to things, you don't have any security. <laughs> so controls the or people and locks. I guess I would just say physical controls. Yeah. This kind of gives it away here. But yeah, physical controls. So okay. Controls implemented to prevent a security incident or information breach. Data controls, I think. Preventative controls. Man, I need a list of controls. Okay, controls implemented to prevent a security incident or information breach. Preventative controls. I was gonna say this is all controls, but I guess it does make sense, especially in the context of having um, you know, restorative controls of having, you know, these other things. It makes sense that this is preventative, but th these are so tricky. Like it, that could almost just as easily be a deterrent control. Like deterring someone from creating a security incident sure seems like a way to prevent it, but okay. We will go with preventative controls. Okay. Controls implemented to restore conditions to normal after security incident. Restorative controls? Recovery controls. So many controls. Um, recovering. I guess, I, I guess like if you backed up everything to a, a SAN or something and were restoring it, you would call this recovery? Like that's data recovery? Or if a hard drive was messed up and you sent it to a data recovery firm? Recovery controls? Okay. How quickly you need to have that application's information available after downtime has occurred? Um, this is like availability time, availability limit, recovery time objective. I, don't know if I, I guess that's an objective, the goal. So, hey, John, I'm glad you find it interesting. I think it's a struggle to get through a lot of this stuff. Um, mostly because it feels it feels very divorced from my like day-to-day -day technical work like knowing this exact name for something versus like oh no here's how we configure the firewall to actually do the thing here's how we set up the network um but uh it's what we need to do the, to pass the cissp and i do think if there's a real benefit of this i think it is forcing <laughs> myself and whoever else is taking this to think about this in a more abstract, less vendor specific way that hopefully makes it easier for us to communicate to people who are not doing this professionally about what all these things are and to maybe help guide them into thinking about like, hey, how quickly do you need this backup? That's our recovery time objective and to have that sort of shared language across organizations. So, so I think this is probably very positive as an overall, you know, mature function of a profession. Um, but it is, it is difficult to get into at some level. Okay. The point in time to which data must be restored in order to successfully resume processing. Um, it's like a, so it's gotta be related to this, like a recovery time objective. So this would be data must be restored. Recovery point objective. So recovery time and recovery point. I agree. Sometimes terms are used too loosely. Um, and so many of them are just a hair's breadth away from another term. Um, point was, this is recovery point objective. So the practical version of this would be, you know, what this really makes me think of is like when you're installing a game on the Xbox and it has like 20% and once it reaches that, you can then get the intro cutscene um, and launch it and play it. You don't have to wait for the other 40 gigs to download. Um, and it's really that, I think. Data must be restored in order to successfully resume processing. Or if you had like a SaaS app and you were able to restore like the last two days of data, but then you didn't restore last week's data, so... People could add more, but they couldn't run reports or something. So that would be 
the recovery point objective. Okay. Okay. Oh gosh, you know it's bad when it starts with a number. A combination of the probability of an event and its consequence, okay? An expectation of loss expresses the probability that a particular threat will exploit a particular vulnerability with a particularly harmful result. Um, combination of the probability of event and its consequence. So let's look up ISO 27000. These are, I, we know these are the standards, but I don't know if this is actually gonna help us answer this question. Hmm, no. Counting the probability. So, certainly this seems like risk, that there's an expectation of loss, a particular threat will exploit, like risk management or risk assessment. Oh, I was too, <laughs> I was too precise. This is all just risk. So I don't know what, ah, starts, if you click the letters, it starts speaking. RFC 2820. Oh, this is just the glossary. <laughs> okay. I was like, there's an RFC for this? There's a risk protocol? Okay. Practice of accepting certain risks typically based on a business decision that may also weigh the cost versus the benefit of dealing with the risk in another way. So is this risk mitigation? Risk acceptance. Ugh, I don't like accepting risk. I want to mitigate it. The practice of accepting certain risks typically based on a business decision that may also weigh the cost versus the benefit of dealing with the risk in another way. Okay, I mean, reading it again, that definitely that definitely makes it seem more acceptance. <laughs> I'm trying to think of an example where, like something I've seen a lot of is um, startups and places, they will set up all their infrastructure in one AWS availability zone, and they won't set up a mirror of that in another availability zone in case the first one goes down for some reason. And that is very much a cost decision where that can be an expensive proposition, literally other than the normal bandwidth issues, that's double what you're normally doing and paying for infrastructure. So you can decide like, all right, well, we trust AWS is gonna be up enough that we don't need to do that. So, okay, risk acceptance. All right, the practice of coming up with alternatives so that the risk in question is not realized. Risk mitigation, please do mitigation. Avoidance, it is, I guess mitigation is reducing the risk, not avoiding it. Uh, practice coming up with alternatives so that the risk in question is not realized. So I guess, so I'm trying to remember like alternatives and avoidance, though I do think risk avoidance is risk mitigation, but we'll see. Elimination of or the significant decrease in the level of risk presented. So help me, this will be the third time I've said risk mitigation. So let's really hope it is this time. Yes, I'm relieved. You know, you take enough shots, eventually you get one right. Um, okay, the practice of passing on the risk in question to another entity such as an insurance company. Uh, risk transference? Huh, risk transfer. Certainly that should be transference. All these big fancy technical legal terms, and they have risk transfer. Okay, a systematic process for identifying, analyzing, evaluating, remedying, and monitoring risk. Um, risk management? Hey, oh. I feel like we just went through that. The last five of these were our risk management. Okay, to find the difference between the original value and the remaining value of an asset after a single exploit. Hmm, I, Asset devaluation, harm, harm maybe? Single loss expectancy. Hmm. That's not a term I think about a lot. Single loss expectancy. This is one of those, like, it's so hard to consider what the, <laughs> 
what the cost of a security breach is, what the cost of an incident is, in terms of an asset, single loss expectancy. And certainly that's something that changes with like every organization. But it's something very different if, you know, a consumer organization or an enterprise, you know, has a security exploit. Hmm. Okay. Any single input to a process that if missing would cause the process or several processes to be unable to function. Um, single point of failure? Single point of failure. That was easy. All right. Next. Um, any word, name, symbol, color, sound, product, shape, device, or combination of these that is used to identify goods and distinguish them from those made or sold by others. All right, so these sold, so we know this is trademark, not copyright, because it's not artistic, and it is trademark. We got it right. Our little mnemonic helped us. I guess that's not technically a mnemonic. It's just like a way to keep it together. Um, proprietary business or technical information processes, designs, practices that are confidential and critical to the business. Um, I'm going to say intellectual property. Sounds right. Trade secret. Uh, well, yes, I suppose. Trade secret. Proprietary business or technical information. Confidential and critical to the business. I guess this confidential and critical is really what makes it a trade secret and not just intellectual property. Because there's lots of things that are the intellectual property of a business that are not confidential and critical. Um, so like their logo. Their logo is intellectual property covered by trademark, I guess. And that's not confidential or critical. Um, but okay. So that was my mistake there. But, all right, moving on. Determines the potential impact of disruptive events on the organization's business process. Potential impact. Um, risk modeling, maybe? Vulnerability assessment. Man, this is, this is one that's very far from the practical. I would, not, I would not describe a vulnerability assessment as this. The potential impact of disruptive events on the organization's business processes. Hmm. And I really, I really kind of disagree with this one <laughs> where I feel like the vulnerability assessment says like, oh yes, you're vulnerable in these particular ways, but hmm, maybe that's, maybe that's me being too tender. I think a vulnerable is like, okay, if you run this web request against the application, you're going to get back the entire, um, it's a SQL injection attack. You're going to get back the entire database of users. That's a vulnerability. Um, the potential impact of the disruptive event. And that's me maybe thinking of vulnerability as a technical item and not as a general business concept where, you know, a DDoS attack on a website, that is not a vulnerability in the, in the there's a bug fix for it, there's a CVE for it. But it is very much a, a vulnerability that if, you know, the website's taken offline and you can't process anything. So I guess this does make sense. I take back my, my objection to this. The vulnerability assessment in terms of potential impact. I think, th I think it just goes back to like the manager's mindset, not the, the technician's mindset for this. Where just very different in this case. Okay. Established to contribute to regional and international security and stability by promoting transparency and greater responsibility and transfers of conventional arms and dual-use goods and technologies, thus preventing destabilizing accumulations. Um, arms Control Act? <laughs> I, I'm not sure. The Wassenaar argument. Oh, gosh. I'm going to... Oh, that's handy. They have, they have a website on export controls for conventional arms and dual use goods and technologies. Regional, international security and stability, promoting transparency, dual use goods. Oh, frequently asked questions. Wassenaar, a suburb of The Hague in the Netherlands, where an agreement was reached 95. Anyone in chat from the Netherlands? Hmm. 
When was it established? 1996. I can't believe these are the actual FAQ questions. I have a very different set of FAQ questions. Like, what the heck are you? What's an example of this? Let's see. This isn't about lists. It's some of the recent changes to the lists. Oh. New D control note. Hmm. Hey. A speak gaming is from uh, Belgium. It's probably you'll probably be the next question. So people from LA. That's very far from the Netherlands. But still. If you're exporting, you need to read this whole list. Hard selectors, cyber incident response. Hmm. So this was kind of useful, but established to contribute to regional and international security and stability, transparency and greater. Hmm. I'll tell you right now, I'm going to mix this up with uh, uh, the Civilian Export Act of 1979, was it? Uh, well, okay. We did pretty good. Uh, went through 42 terms. I'm not going to sign up to save my progress because I don't think I had much progress. Um, does anyone in the chat have any questions uh, around CISSP, what we're doing? Did you like this format? Is there something else you'd like to see? Hmm. Not a lot of responses, though there is a delay. So you may not have heard me yet. Um, how do we, ISAC Hernandez, wait, how would you get the answers to a test? Um, my understanding of Quizlet is that this is more like flashcard study. And so this is really, and this is my strategy for passing the CISSP, is to understand the concepts for real and to not try to almost teach myself the test, but to make it so that I genuinely understand the concept and the reasoning behind it. And that by doing that, I'm able to both, you know, progress professionally as well as pass the test. Um, so, all right, I see more into flowing, get the concepts as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And to really, I think the more that we can individually go through each of the concepts and really understand what surrounds it and like where it sits with the other ones where, so I had mentioned the, the subreddit, the CISSP subreddit. And something I see a lot in there is that people are saying like, oh, the questions on the practice exams, because there's a lot of practice exams out there, which are multiple choice, which is, you know, gives you the question and four answers and you choose the one. And if you get it wrong, then you go back and do it again. And I have a few other resources we might do like that. But um, I think that is not as effective, both in terms of the overall amount of study time and in terms of actually learning as just learning the concepts and then using the concepts to, to beat the test. That's how we're cheating to beat the test is by learning the concepts really well <laughs> instead of just studying for it. Um, yeah. So Mike Raymond, that guy asks, how long do you need to study for the CISSP before taking it? Um, the answer is usually a lot. Like I, most of the time I see people studying for like a couple months, um, depending upon everything else that's going on in their lives and how much time they can put into it. Uh, I haven't actually set a date or scheduled when to take the exam yet. Um, uh, I don't know when that's going to be. <laughs> so while we're working on the format, if I can get more time to do more streams to do more, it might be helpful. So, okay. Well, I think that's really it for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you come back in a couple weeks and uh, maybe it's something we can do even more. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. I will talk to you later.